Hello and let's talk about prisons and COVID-19. Or more precisely, are our prisons prepared to handle a potential outbreak? Our justice system is already crumbling due to overcrowding in prisons and poor infrastructure, not to mention the absurdly long time taken for cases to be heard in court. And this is not only the situation in India, but in many parts of the global south. A few states in India have taken steps on this matter, but much more remains to be done. We'll discuss this further, but first here are some details on the issue. Ever since the beginning of the outbreak, prisoners have been holding demonstrations in jails and detention centres around the world, demanding safety measures. In Colombia, a protest was brutally suppressed by prison guards, leading to the death of close to 25 prisoners. The WHO estimates that there are 11 million inmates in prisons worldwide. There are another 20 million people directly or indirectly connected with prisons, either as employees or as relatives, friends and lawyers of inmates. Prisons in most countries, in at least 121 according to one estimate, are overcrowded. The Supreme Court of India on March 16 directed all states to submit reports on steps being taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19 among inmates. On March 23rd, it said that those who are charged or convicted of crimes whose jail terms are less than 7 years could be given bail or parole. Following this, Tihar jail authorities on March 26 released over 400 inmates and may release some more. Similarly, Maharashtra released over 600 prisoners towards the end of the month, that's March. Maharashtra and UP authorities together may release about 22,000 inmates if media reports are to be believed. We talked to activist Gautam Navlaka on this issue. Thank you so much, Gautam, for joining us. So as we mentioned, this is actually a global problem and it in some ways shows the very broken nature of the global justice system, so-called so -called justice system. And the number of people who are in jail, the number of people who are under trials and the kind of... Uh, absolute lack of facilities available uh, uh, to, pay, to people who are in prison. So could you first give us a kind of a global picture on what you see in terms of what is happening uh, in prisons and detention centers when it comes to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, world over the same problem faces all the jail authorities and especially the prisoners, which is that they are in overcrowded jails and how do you ensure social distancing in overcrowded jails when the space is confined, your movements, or there are restrictions placed? Uh, how do you handle that situation? This is a common phenomena, and that's why we have uh, seen reports of uh, jail um, prisoners uh, protesting. Uh, there have been clashes between prisoners and jail authorities. Families have protested because uh, visitation rights have been curtailed. Uh, so there are a number of uh, issues. Uh, people who work in jails, they face problems because they have to commute with restrictions. How do they do it? Movement of goods. Uh, uh, it's a whole range of issues that suddenly faces prisoners. Yeah. which otherwise is more or less ignored, you know, uh, in normal, so-called normal times. Right. And this is, this becomes, I mean, in a country like India, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty bad. Because if you go by the latest prison statistics, uh, which is brought out by uh, uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs, and the department NCRB, the National Crime Reports uh, Bureau. Uh, it makes it, it shows very clearly uh, the very high occupancy rates. Now, on an average, they say the Indian jails have become more crowded on an, on, at an all India level. But what this average heights is the reality on the ground in various states. It's much far worse in some states it's slightly better in other places. For instance, Uttar Pradesh boasts of the highest occupancy rate in India. So the national average is 118%, which means if the jail capacity is 100, uh, it's 118 on an average across the jails in India. But in Uttar Pradesh, it is actually 180%. So it shows you the extent of it. And States after states, uh, Maharashtra has 150% occupancy rate. Uh, uh, Bihar is slightly better, but Madhya Pradesh is 100. Is uh, uh, about uh, uh, Delhi, in fact, has pretty bad. It's 150 
four percent uh, occupancy rate. Uh, Chhattisgarh has 153 percent. And remember, these are the places where Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand, which have very high percent occupancy rate, uh, is the place where a lot of Adivasis, uh, the tribal people, have been picked up under all kind of uh, cooked up charges, right. and they've been rotting inside the jail as under trials. That's another phenomena that uh, we must keep in mind. So when we talk about the prison population, it comprises convicts, under trials, and detainees. Okay, these are the three categories of prisoners uh, normally inside any Indian jail. Uh, the sad thing about Indian jails is the very high percentage of of uh, under trials. Uh, nearly seventy percent of all prisoners in India are under trials. So, I mean, which 40 years back, uh, Prashant, uh, India Supreme Court had said, uh, had, uh, you know, had talked about the presence of the prevalence of under trials in prison as something which, uh, uh, which was shameful. Right. And they have repeatedly talked about that bail is a right and jail is an, is a, an exception. Mm -hmm. Now, is completely been overturned. What we have now is that jail has become the norm and bail is now an exception. Right. As a result, you have very high percentage of under trials <clears throat> whose guilt has still not been established, right. who are not convicts. And therefore, they are, uh, for all practical reasons, innocent because they, are, they, they have not been proven guilty. Uh, they are the ones who suffer the most. That's one part of the problem. The other, other problem, Prashant, is that inside the jails, we have, I mean, India's uh, the jail population is also very skewed. So you find that the percentage of Muslims, Dalit, Adivasis, and backward castes mm -hmm. is 85% altogether. Literacy amongst them I mean, 70% of them have studied less than class 10. So it's, that is another feature of the Indian jails, where you find that the poor, uh, the, the less privileged, uh, the more vulnerable sections and marginalized sections of the population seem to constitute the highest number of, uh, of uh, prison population. So keeping all this in mind, uh, at a time like coronavirus, the simple, I mean, the, the question that comes to mind is, how do they ensure social distancing? Mm -hmm. Now, in Maharashtra, for instance, if the jail capacity is 24,000, whereas the prison population is 36,000, now they have announced that they're going to cut down the prison population by 11,000. But even that will not bring it down to... Uh, even 100%, yeah. 200%. It will be much more. It will still remain much more. Now, how do you ensure? How do you segregate those who are well, I mean, who don't show any symptoms, those who are vulnerable and are likely, probably more likely to, uh, to, to get infected? How do you ensure that they are segregated from yeah. others? Because the prison is not made up where you can at will just shift the prison population wherever you want. It has to be done in an extremely organized fashion exactly. to keep the different uh, prison populations separate uh, as well as safe. The sad thing is that we still do not know, despite the fact that the Supreme Court intervened in this matter, very little, or very hardly any news has come. Barring Maharashtra, no, none of the other states have come out with... Uh, with affidavits or with statements which plan, which uh, tell the public what they are planning to do with the prison population in the time of coronavirus pandemic. And this is despite the fact that globally there has been a very strong campaign to release as many prisoners as possible because most jails are failing, like you said, to uh, provide the necessary protection. Correct. In fact, even, I mean, the Supreme Court's own observations Maharashtra government's affidavit, which is the only thing that we have on record today, make it clear that they are thinking in terms of uh, giving payroll or uh, uh, bail 
to a large uh, to a fairly large section of prison population which is uh, inside the prison because of some petty crime or their near completion of their sentence etc etc so these are the kind of people that they are targeting but as we would see i mean if you look at the prison data you'll also discover that a very high percentage of uh, prison population comprises uh, people who have been charged with or accused of uh, serious crimes now how do you do if the prison population comprises the maximum number of prison population comprises them even if they are fake the point is the charges are very serious uh, what do you do with them how do you ensure their safety inside the prison so this is this is a problem that prevails and we know very little about what is happening in, in inside the jails in india right. so right now the need is also for uh, some amount of transparency from the authorities on this issue like the rest of the pandemic itself even on the issue of jails for instance a clear uh, say series of policies that maybe even laid down at the central level for all states to follow so that all certain and the, even the families of those inside prisons are relatively they feel at ease that their relatives may will not be affected yeah just consider this prashant um, because of corona virus visitations have been stopped so prison prisoners have no access to their uh, to the family which they were allowed to at least once a week right just for half an hour now the even that has been done away with so what have they replaced it with have they allowed prisoners to access the family over telephone so that they can ensure that their families are not anxious on on their account these are the prelim you know uh, the right. elementary steps that the government should have taken and announced they haven't done it and if if we don't report this how else will public come to know about what is actually happening right and if and the pressure could be mounted on the authorities to do something about it so that's the ba ba basic uh, that's precisely where we are right now thank you so much god for talking to us in our next story we look at the restrictions and challenges being faced by the media during the time of the pandemic prime minister narendra modi was very effusive in his praise of the media but the situation on the ground is very different journalists are being harassed by the police in various parts of the country On the other hand there is a question of what happens when you counter the official version of the country's response to the pandemic. This issue even came up in the Supreme Court. Then yesterday there was a news of an FIR being filed against the digital portal The Wire. We talked to senior journalist Paranjay Gautamkurta on these issues. Here is what he had to say. Thank you so much Paranjay for joining us. So you have written in a you have written an article today in News Click about uh the restrictions that have been imposed on the media and like you mentioned we saw the FIR mentioning the wire that was filed that is filed yesterday in which even reporting about or mentioning what actually happened on the ground is is being used in a criminal procedure and the key question has been that from the very beginning there was a concern that how would this impact the freedom of the media considering the modi government's record over the years so do you see the worst fears that people had at the beginning actually coming true after uh, i wrote this article in news click i have been predictably trolled by the right winger saying no no what's wrong with what the supreme court has said but let's go step by step what the union home secretary ajay bhalla stated in his status report given to the supreme court it was a 39 page document given on the last day of march what he said and and he was very very clear the government urged the supreme court to direct the media not to print publish or telecast anything without first ascertaining the true and factual position and what would that be the position or the facts or the or the events the way they would be reported by the central government now what did the supreme court say the supreme court on the same day that is the 31st march the bench of the supreme court headed by the chief justice of india and it in, it included justice l nageshwara rao it said very very clearly that you know be careful don't spread panic 
it is not we, we have to be very careful and if you spread panic such a person shall be punished with imprisonment which may extend to one year or with fine and he also goes on to say that the migration of a large number of laborers working in the cities were triggered by panic created by fake news that the lockdown would continue for more than three months having said all this what is important is that the Supreme Court said, you are free, the media is free to report and to include the version of the government. That is essentially the substance of what the, the Supreme Court said. That you have to be careful, but also include the government version. Having said all this, the question would be, what if the government doesn't respond to queries from the media? And this is a point that Barkhad Dath and many other people are saying. And, and the question is, yes, what if despite your best effort to get a view from the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court does not respond? Really the government. Yes. Uh, that's sorry, I, I beg your pardon. Despite your best effort to get information from the government, what happens is the government doesn't respond. So I think the issue is that the Supreme Court is not saying you can't report on what is happening, but include the government version. Now, in, in my opinion, you know, th th this is all really the, the, the text, the, 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 the print of the judgment. But I think the real story is what is not being given there, what is in the subtext, what is beneath the surface. I mean, I mean, look what happened. I mean, the prime minister at one level praises the media and, and says, you, you guys are doing selfless service, uh, tireless efforts. He goes to the nitty gritty and he tells, you know, you, you should be careful while you're reporting. Tells the TV guys, have a boom mic, make sure you're one meter away from the people you're reporting. Even as he says all this, the cops, in Delhi, they abuse and beat up Naveen Kumar, a reporter with Aaj Tak, the Hindi channel in Hyderabad. There, there are uh, Ravi Reddy, he's the head of the Hindu English daily newspaper, uh, Mendu Srinivas of Andhra Jyoti, Mohammed Hassan of Siyasat, all of them are assaulted. Now, the point is, you might say these are isolated examples, these are just a few examples, but if police personnel in the capital of India and in Hyderabad can act in the manner that they did. Should you be surprised when you have this recorded evidence of the cops beating people up? And, 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 and you know, I mean, and almost invariably they're the poor, they're the underprivileged. So what I'm arguing is that the government, you know, we are living in a post-truth world. Mr. Modi says something to the heads of media organizations, the owners of media organizations, <clears throat> and he says, oh, you must help us, you must be part of the government, uh, almost as if you are a part of the government. And, and almost everybody who was there on that occasion uh, seems to have, you know, sort of uh, gone along with what the government has said. Now, a very detailed report on the subject has been done by Sagar in Caravan with input from Mayor Mehak Mahajan. And, and uh, it, it, it concludes with an interesting observation. It says that, you know, it, I mean, he spoke to quite a few of the people uh, who were present. Uh, there were nine owners and editors of media houses from uh, different parts of the country uh, who were part of that interaction with the prime minister on, 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 on the 23rd of March. And, and the report, that is Sagar's report in the caravan, concludes by saying, it appeared that the prime minister inspired most of them to abandon a basic tenet of journalism, to speak truth not positivity to power. I mean, look, it's the job of the journalists to ask difficult questions to whoever is in power. In this case, it's the Narendra Modi government. Mr. Narendra Modi government does not give interviews. Mr. Modi does not give interviews to journalists who are likely to ask him difficult questions. He gives interviews to, he picks and chooses the people he has to interview. And it's interesting that we find that a, a former supporter of Prime Minister Modi, senior journalist Kavleen Singh, you know, in one of her tweets in response to what Barkha Dath had said, 
she recalled what Indira Gandhi uh, said after the emergency. Right. She said that what was when Indira Gandhi was asked what was her bigger mis biggest mistake during the emergency, she said press censorship. So I think we've gone back there, except that it's not blatant. Indira Gandhi put journalists behind bars, put her political opponents behind bars. This government has been far more, what should I say, uh, clever. It financially squeezed the media. It, it ensures that access is given only to journalists who tow the official line. I mean, I mean uh, uh, today we are living in a different day and age. We are living in a day and age where the social media is, is, is proliferated like what we could never have imagined. And, and you know, Prashant, there's no doubt about the fact that, yes, fake news is a problem. Right. But in curtailing fake news, let's not curb the right to free expression. Let's not curb journalism, which asks tough questions from those who are in positions of power and authority. Let the... The, the cure not be worse than the disease. And it's especially ironic because over the past two days we saw a very communally charged set of TV mm. programs being conducted by especially Hindi news channels after the cases emerged from the Nizamuddin Markaz meeting. And uh, there was no, uh, say, pushback from the government on any of that despite a very provocative and communally charged language being used there. But all the pushback seems to be on any criticism that the government that the government is receiving. You are absolutely correct, you know, and uh, what has happened is not just this. Uh, it's not just the attempt to play up all that happened in in, in, in the episode concerning the Tablighi Jamaat in Nizamuddin. Uh, but the point is, if you look at the first information report that has been lodged by the Uttar Pradesh police against Siddharth Vardarajan, Again, you find uh, a similar pattern. Now, uh, if I can just briefly give you the facts of the case. Now, I mean, there have been two first information reports that have been lodged by the Uttar Pradesh police. They, I mean, they, uh, Siddharth Vardarajan has been uh, accused of violating various provisions uh, of the Indian Penal Code, which include uh, the provisions pertaining to rumors, spreading uh, uh, with uh, spreading rumors, falsehoods, uh, with the intent to incite uh, or promote enmity among different groups and classes in society, including religious groups. And, and uh, if there is a particular provision even for the Information Technology Act, uh, Section 66D of the Information Technology Act, which is about cheating by impersonation. Now, now let's go and see uh, what the first information report alleged. Now, what has happened is, in a particular tweet, what Siddharth Vardarajan wrote was that the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, had attended a public religious event at Ayodhya in Faizabad on the 25th of March, after the Prime Minister announced a three-week-long lockout. Uh, a lockdown in the entire country. Now, one mistake that he made, but there was a line in the article that appeared in The Wire, which attributed a particular statement <coughs> to the Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath, whereas that statement had actually been made by Acharya Parampins, who was the head of the official Ayodhya Temple Trust. What is it? He said that Lord Ram would protect his devotees from the coronavirus. Now what happened is Mr. Vardarajan and The Wire published a clarification mm -hmm. and said no, and, and, and said that no, uh, that this was falsely or wrongly attributed, this statement was wrongly attributed to Yogi Adityanath, whereas it was actually made by Acharya Paramahansa. But the media advisor to the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh really got after uh, Siddharth Vardarajan, Mithunjay Kumar, that's his name. He says that despite warnings, uh, uh, he did not delete his lies or seek an apology. And, and he even targeted him and saying, now you'll have to seek donations to fight this case. And, and Siddharth Vardarajan and The Wire, uh, they put out a statement saying this has been really a politically motivated uh, 
uh, uh, politically motivated action, uh, and it really impinges on the right to free expression. And according to the wire, the Uttar Pradesh police has, you know, made it his job, made it its job to go after those who are critical of the prime minister. Now, this is one more instance of how rules and laws can be used and misused, interpreted and misinterpreted by those who uh, don't like criticism, those who are intolerant towards criticism. I mean, Indira Gandhi was high-handed. She put her critics and journalists behind bars. I mean, only a few publications uh, had the courage to oppose it. You know, the Indian Express published a blank space uh, on the editorial page. The statesman Himmat were among the uh, publications that, uh, b- 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 that, that also right. opposed the emergency. And, and after the emergency, after Indira Gandhi lost the elections in March 1977, uh, uh, and Muraji Desai became the Prime Minister of India, in his government there was uh, L.K. Advani, Lal Krishna Advani. And he was once asked, uh, why did so many editors so meekly, uh, you know, sort of agree to everything that Indira Gandhi said. And, and he famously remarked, when they were asked to bend, they, they crawl. When they were asked to bend, they crawl. Today, Mr. Modi doesn't have to worry because he's not even been asking them to bend. They're already crawling, much of the media. Thank you so much, Paranjay, for talking to us. Thank you. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the major news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching News Clip. Thank <laughs> you.